Good evening, good evening and welcome to this final lecture of the season 2021 of Studium Generale. My name is Barbara Strating and I am one of the program makers of Studium Generale and I'm, tonight I have the honor to be in a museum. So this is not a streaming from our own venue, nor is it from my own living room, but tonight I'm a guest at Bureau Europa here in Maastricht and together we have invited Rebecca Grompertz, one of the, the founder actually of uh, Women on Waves to give a lecture about her work in the past years. Um, for me, it's just a small remark before we start. Um, if you have any questions concerning the lecture tonight, please use the Q&A, because afterwards, after the lecture that will last for of about an hour, we will have some time for questions from the audience. So please, um, ask the question Q&A. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat function in Zoom and I will be there um, at the background to answer your questions and see what I can fix. But now I would like to invite Floor van Spaandonk, General Director of Bureau Europa, to give an introduction to tonight's lecture. Thank you, Barbara, for the collaboration with the university and uh, welcome, dear audience. Tonight's lecture from Rebecca Gompertz takes place in the context of our exhibition, Love in a Mist, the Architecture of Fertility, whereby several involving narratives explore the space and politics of fertility. Malkit Shoshan, architect and curator of the exhibition, initiated, initiated this exhibition in Harvard in 2019, as she was triggered by the Hard Bill Beat Bill, which was passed into law in several states in the United States. In this law, abortions are criminalized from as early as six weeks into pregnancy. Love in the Mist, as an exhibition, almost an installation, explores the society's quest to control, control women and nature and the resulting environment degradation. It brings together issues such as the historical use of synthetic hormones in women's bodies, measures to supersize farm animals, and domesticate plants and techniques to accelerate fertility and extract natural resources. From the treatment of women's bodies to the exploitative human relationship with nature, Love in a Mist examines spaces of fertility, including abortion clinics, artificial wombs, courtrooms, farmed landscapes, and swamps, as extrapolated, extrapolated from diverse accounts and imaginaries by scholars, activists, legislators, ecologists, biologists, artists, and designers. I was triggered by Malkit's thorough research and work and the intrinsic connection she makes between spatial design and human rights. And I'm very happy and very honored that we have it here now in Maastricht. Tonight, we will zoom into one aspect of the exhibition, which touches in a way on the sp spatial topology of women's health, but goes much further than this. Tonight, I'm very honored with the presence, therefore, of Rebecca Gompertz. Rebecca, as Barbara already mentioned, is the founder and director of Women on Ways and contributor to the exhibition. Rebecca studied medicine and visual arts in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, of course. And after graduating, uh, uh, Rebecca became an abortion doctor, and she sailed with the Green Greenpeace ship, Rainbow Warrior as its doctor and as an environmental activist. While sailing in South America, she encountered many women who suffered greatly due to the lack of access to reproductive health, health services and safe legal abortions. These women and their stories inspired Rebecca to start Women on Waves. Rebecca has also written Seedrift and other articles and essays. And she was a, a great company in the development of uh, this exhibition and also in dialogue with us, the team of Bureau Europa, to uh, realize um, what it means for Maastricht even to not have an abortion clinic and what the impact is also in the Netherlands. Uh, but I should not talk too much about this. I'm uh, giving the floor to Rebecca and I think we should all give a very virtual applause. Um, and I hope you enjoy the evening. Rebecca, very welcome. Thank you, Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, even without audience. Um, but fortunately, that is almost finishing, so we can all meet each other in live again. 
And that also means, I think, which is interesting is that uh, the abortion clinics in the Netherlands saw a decline in abortions in the last year. And probably that's also because there has been much less uh, unpredicted sex um, because people were not meeting each other. Um, so I, my, my, uh, my lecture is going to be about abortion, which is always about politics and not so much about science or um, common sense even. Um, the title is The Power of Abortion Pills. And now I can do myself the slide. So I always begin with going back some, to some of the pre assumptions that people have. Uh, because when you say abortion, everybody has an idea, a feeling, an emotion, um, you know, an idea about what it means, you know, and um, there's a lot of misconceptions. So one of them is, for example, that abortion is rare. Um, because it's such taboo, people don't often talk about it. Um, but if you look at the numbers, uh, every year, by the way, this number is incorrect. Uh, it's uh, from an old slide. Every year there's um, uh, 78 million abortions per year. And um, of these, still 22% uh, ends their pregnancy. So there's about 40, 000, uh, sorry, 40 million abortions take place every year. And half of them, about 20 million, are in countries where abortion is illegal, not allowed by law. Um, if you look at the numbers in the Netherlands, for example, one in five women will have an abortion once in her lifetime. So one of the suggestions that I always have for the audience is ask your mother, your grandmother, your aunts, your sister, your friends, and ask them if they have ever had an abortion. And they might be willing to talk about it when you ask, and when you ask about it without any prejudgment. Um, and I think it's very important because that's the way to break the taboo, but also to normalize it. Um, it is a very normal medical procedure. About 20% of women of, who are pregnant have a miscarriage. So it means that the number of miscarriages is more, almost equal to the number of abortions. Um, and that means that about half of the pregnancies never end in the birth of a, of a child, of a baby. The other misconception is that abortion is hurting women. And that can be by that it's dangerous or that it will cause depression or that women will have a higher rate of suicide or that it's just really difficult and that women find it an extremely hard decision. By the way, I need to say women and pregnant people um, because it's very important to be gender inclusive. And so when I mean, when I say women, I do mean pregnant people. Um, but for me, it's easier to use the word women, um, but I will try to mix it up a little bit. So what we know from independent research is that 99% of the women don't find this a difficult decision at all. They know the moment that they're pregnant that they just don't want to be pregnant and that they want to stop the pregnancy. Um, there is no link between suicide or depression or any mental health uh, issue and abortion. On the other hand, when you look at postnatal depression, and that is depression after giving birth, 15% of the women are suffering from that. And that is a very real, very, um, uh, uh, th th those depressions are very severe usually. Uh, but that is not something that you are told when you are pregnant. They won't say, hey, listen, you know, 15% chance that you will get out of this with a severe depression. Now, um, I always think it's very important to know where you can find these data. Um, and so I'm showing you those scientific articles. They're all from the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a very well-known, very well-respected medical journal. Um, and these are the, 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 um, uh, the articles. Uh, the other claim that some of the anti-abortion groups make is that it causes breast cancer. Also, that has been researched all over you know, all the time, and it doesn't cause any, it doesn't increase the risk of breast cancer. But these are um, misinformation, which is spread with, an, um, with a purpose. And one of the purposes is that the anti-abortion groups, when they, initially they were always focusing on the fetus. 
that it was about the fetus. Um, but it's, uh, but that made them seem heartless because what about women? And so then they started changing their rhetoric to say that it's also causing harm to women so that they became kind of women friendly in their messaging. And this is also something that we saw in the Netherlands before there was an organization that was called the um, Vereniging Ter Bescherming van het Ongeboren Kind. And they greenwashed their name. Uh, and it's now called CIRES. And CIRES is an anti-abortion organization, but they get uh, a lot of money from the government to counsel women with unwanted pregnancies. And then they pretend to have um, neutral counseling, but they don't. Um, and that is a tactic that has come from the United States as well, where you have a lot of um, pregnancy counseling centers that are actually anti-abortion organizations that are trying to change women's minds, but they pretend to be their neutral counseling. And that's very confusing. Now, another myth is that it's against somebody's religion. And why I say it's a myth, it's because, for example, we're here in a, in a Catholic environment. If you look at the original, the real documents of the Catholic Church, and this is from one of the, the 1969 documents, and I forgot exactly the name, but um, you can find it. And it says there, all abortions, even for therapeutic reasons, are absolutely excluded and are not, not allowed. But equally condemned is sterilization or actually any sexual intercourse that is not intended to procreate. So most people, also Catholic women, they use contraceptives. And I don't think that's a taboo anymore, but within the Vatican's papers itself, actually it's equally condemned as having an abortion. So there's a lot of um, bias, like um, picky, nitty picky there, what, uh, from, the, from the original documents. The other misconception is that as long as women use contraceptives, uh, you know, they won't need abortions. And even if you look at uh, a contraceptive like the pill, which is one of the most effective, the typical user's failure rate is around 7%. And that means that every year, seven of the 100 women using the pill will get pregnant anyway. So what is normal for, in the Netherlands, many people are using the pill. You start when you, when they start having sex around 16, perhaps before, perhaps after a little bit, and they use it up till the time that they want to get pregnant. So that's usually 10 to 15 years or even longer, 20 years. So every year you have a 7% chance that you will get pregnant anyway. So what you see in the abortion rates in the Netherlands, actually there's a lot of people that use contraceptives, but they failed. The other myth is that it's just young, stupid women that didn't think about it, that didn't take measures, and that's not true either. Um, in the Netherlands, and actually worldwide, about half of the women that need an abortion are women that already have children. So they know exactly what it means to have a family and to raise a child. Um, and they often do it also because they want to be able to give their children the best that they can. And, and, uh, and that they, when they decide on abortion, that is not anything that, that they feel that they can do that. But as a result as well, because in many countries where abortion is illegal, women are dying because of unsafe abortion practices. And I'll talk about, a bit about that later. About more than 200,000 children per year are losing their mothers. Now, what is, where are these abortions illegal? This is a map from the world and the countries that are green, the law allows for abortion. It's not always uh, decriminalized. Sometimes it has a legal, it's legalized. It means that in certain conditions you can have it. In the red and the orange countries, <coughs> abortion is only allowed uh, for when the mother's life or health or the woman's life or health is at risk. So the red countries is when her life is at risk and the orange countries is when her health is at risk. But these maps say only so much because actually at the moment, it's easier to get an abortion in Tanzania where it's only allowed to have it because of health reasons than in many states of the United States. So there's a lot of ways that you can create obstacles and make it impossible for women to access abortion services. Um, before 20 years, there was only one method that you could do an abortion, and it was a surgical abortion, which means that you had to know somebody who knows and understands your uh, anatomy. 
uh, and then the, a small tube was inserted in the womb and it was then um, with a negative pressure the pregnancy was uh, taken out um, and in the end of the 1980s um, the abortion pills were invented um, and that was in France in France was the first time and then the abortion pills became registered first in England and in Sweden and in around 2000 they were registered in, the, in, in all of Europe and also in the US and many other, other countries. Um, but there's another way that women can do an, uh, an abortion with uh, medicines and that is the, only the second pill. So the, 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 best, the best treatment and the most effective treatment is the combination of, it's called mifepristone and misoprostol. But the second tablet actually works pretty well by itself as well. It has a 94% effectivity. Um, now, how does it work? Um, the mifepristone is blocking the pregnancy hormone progesterone, which is needed to keep the pregnancy intact. And then the second pill, the misoprostol, is causing the contractions of the womb that then expels the pregnancy. It's actually very similar to a miscarriage. So I told you beginning in the lecture that 20% of the women have a mis spontaneous miscarriage. And the pills are basically inducing a spontaneous miscarriage. Many times when a woman has a spontaneous miscarriage, she just starts bleeding, has cramping, takes a few days, and then it's over. And then the whole cycle starts again, and she has her menstruation back between four and eight weeks later. With the abortion pill, it's exactly the same. And it's very rare, and it's very rare that there is a complication. And the complication rate is similar to with a natural miscarriage, which is spontaneous miscarriage. Um, and that can be sometimes that the, the womb doesn't contract well enough, and that can cause too much bleeding. And especially the longer in pregnancy, the bigger the risk. But uh, in, uh, uh, it's less than 1% that that happens. Um, and for example, in countries where abortion is illegal, women can go to the doctor and say that they had a miscarriage because the doctors cannot see the difference. So they cannot be denounced and cannot go to jail because there are still countries in the world where women go to jail for having an abortion. Uh, or for and, and a lot of the hospital staff uh, participates in denouncing these women. Now here you can see the difference between the, the registration of the two medicines. And what is interesting is the first, the second medicine, misoprostol, was actually registered originally for another indication. Uh, and that was to protect the stomach um, while using a painkiller, diclofenac. Um, and that was registered much more widely all over the world. It's called Cytotec. And then the mifepristone became known as the abortion pill, and it became much harder to register it all over the world. Although that changed now, there's more countries where it's registered. But that pill has been very restricted. So the misoprostol is available on, in the pharmacy in most countries, on a prescription of a doctor or sometimes over the counter. But the mifepristone, somehow they put regulations there that you can only take it in special clinics in front of the doctor. And that pill actually doesn't have any effects. It's the second pill, the misoprostol, that is causing the bleeding and the miscarriage. But that is, the, so the, the way the regulations are put in place have nothing to do with how the medicines work. Um, and of course, women, when they know about it, they find it anywhere. They go to a pharmacy with a prescription or there is black markets everywhere around the world. You have internet sites now and black markets and sometimes in clinics, but also online. And I will talk about that later. What we have found in the last 20 years is that abortion pills are safe, they're acceptable, they're very private. And um, for example, the risk, the risk profile is that it is as safe as commonly used over-the-counter painkillers, such as paracetamol or diclofenac. One in 20,000 women in, a, in, a, in a Europe die because of giving birth. That's not something you hear when you get pregnant. They'll say, oh, congratulations, so nice, you're getting a baby. But actually, uh, there's a lot of uh, complications that uh, women suffer because of a pregnancy. Uh, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, um, after giving birth, severe bleeding. So it has quite a high mortality rate. The uh, mortality of a safe abortion, early abortion, is one in half a million. So it is safer for a woman to end her pregnancy and to continue with the pregnancy and give birth. If you compare it with uh, traffic road accidents as well, uh, uh, in one in 25 
thousand people in Netherlands are dying uh, in the cause of an uh, of a road uh, traffic uh, um, accident. Um, and if you look at the mortality of unsafe abortion, which means the dangerous methods, and the dangerous methods are usually invasive methods. So that is uh, sticking uh, knitting needles, sticks, um, and things that are put in the womb um, to try to uh, cause an abortion. But these can also be massages. In some countries, women really they use bleach or, uh, or other poisons to try to uh, induce a miscarriage. Now. In the 20 years I've been doing this work, a lot of things have changed. Uh, 20 years ago, an abort safe abortion was not yet recognized as a human right. Um, Amnesty International didn't want to give any, you know, take any stance on it. Um, but in the last 10, 15 years, um, the United Nations, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, all the human rights institutions have recognized a safe abortion as a human right. Uh, and um, also, the World Health Organization. This is, an, uh, is a slide from the World Health Organization, um, and so that has made the work to advance access to safe abortion much easier. Um, because, for example, many courts now judge that it is a right for women to have access to uh, a safe abortion, um, and 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 we see that, for example, in the changes that were recently there in Ireland and in Northern Ireland. And I'll get back to that later but also in, North, in, in South Korea. Now, I told you in the beginning of the, uh, of the presentation that it might be easier for women to get an abortion now in Tanzania than in the United States. So what are causing the obstacles for women to access safe abortions? Well, one of them can be the law. It's a ban, can, cannot have it because doctors can go to jail, which is actually also the case in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, abortion is legalized, but it is still a criminal offense. For the doctors that are helping women, if they don't do it exactly according to the things written in the law, they can go to jail for four years. So it's not considered yet a normal medical treatment that is regulated by the normal, you know, regulations that are uh, they call it bequam uh, and bevoegd and bequam. Um, I don't know the words in English. Right? But it's really specially regulate, re, regulated in the, in the criminal code. Another way it can be, for example, to refuse to register the abortion pill, which is, has happened in Japan, but also in Hungary, for example, where abortion is legal, but they don't want women to have access to the abortion pills. Another reason can be financial. In, in the Netherlands, for example, women can have, Dutch women have access to free abortions. They don't have to pay for it. The, the state pays for it. But if you are a foreign student or you are undocumented here, you have to pay for your abortion. Here in Maastricht, for example, there is no abortion clinic. Women have to go to, to Roermond, which is a 45 hour minute train ride. Um, and so that can be another obstacle logistically, um, because for some people it's really difficult to travel. Um, if you can think about um, uh, women with a handicap, but also that are in controlled situations by their parents or their partner. Um, but um, there can be many other reasons why women uh, are not able to travel to have an abortion. And that is also what research has shown, that the farther away the abortion clinics, the more women will um, have problem to access abortion services. And, and what it does, it's not that it, um, what it does, it's always affecting the most vulnerable women. Because somebody who has money and access to information, they have their own car, uh, or they, uh, you know, they they will be able to. For them, it's easier to travel or to go places, or even go abroad. Um, some women have children where they have to look uh, after, and for example, especially during COVID, when all the kids were at home, it, it was extremely hard for women if they would have had a pregnancy to organize for childcare. Uh, nobody was allowed to, you know, even if, especially when somebody, you know, one of the kids was, you know, having, was ill or things like that, but also stigma. Um, and in some cases, people can just not take off free from their work. You know, you cannot just take a, a day leave then you will be fired. That's, for example, the case in the United States. Um, so all these things are causing obstacles and 
the work that we have been doing in the last few years is really to try to document these obstacles and to understand them better because it's really hard to do research because when a, women don't find a way to clinic, they're lost in the system normally. But because of internet and because of the online services, women are finding alternatives. And we are now an alternative service like that. So we, the women were reaching out to us. Um, so I will start now talking a little bit about our work. And I will start with the work of um, Women on Waves. And Women on Waves was founded 20 years ago. Uh, and the idea was that if you have a ship, uh, then you can go to a country where abortion is illegal and you can take women outside international waters because the local criminal laws don't apply anymore. And so the ship uh, was set up and our first campaign was to Ireland. And I will show you a small video clip from the campaign in Ireland. Into controversy dismissed by some as a public relations stunt, the Dutch fishing vessel, the Aurora, docked in Dublin. Strapped to the upper deck, a cargo container. Inside, a fully equipped abortion clinic. Their plan to take women wanting abortions out to sea into international waters where organizers say they will operate under Dutch law. The women on the ship say they can't change women's lives or Irish laws with a two-week stay. But they have succeeded in putting abortion back on the public agenda here. And that, they say, is what they intended to do all along. Okay. So this was uh, more than 20 years ago already. So it's a long time ago. This was our first campaign with the ship. And it was overwhelming because there was the whole world press was there. CNN, BBC, everybody was standing at shore to see the first time there was a ship that was offering abortion services. And since then, Ireland has legalized abortion and our work has been a big part of that. And I'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, now, the other thing that we started do doing is training women's rights organization because medicines are available sometimes locally, but people don't know about it and they don't know how to use it. So we, uh, we, tr we launched safe abortion hotlines. Um, and that is now actually the main strategy in most of the Latin America countries. Uh, so um, the first time that we launched the safe abortion hotline was in Ecuador. And this was the Virgin of Quito, which is a huge, huge, huge virgin statue on the mountain in Quito. And uh, we had made a banner uh, saying Aborto Seguro and the number, and we had invited the journalists to come there. Um, and so again, this was part of the work is that it becomes in the news so that women can find the number and then they can call the number. And then the people that we trained, they gave information about how you can do an abortion yourself safely with the pills that they could buy over uh, in the pharmacy there. And the way that they were also spreading the news was, for example, by starting to stamp money bills uh, and sticking uh, posters and, uh, and graffiti and like really underground ways of distributing uh, information. Some of the uh, women's groups that we trained, and we did it in Kenya, in Indonesia, in Pakistan, um, in Tanzania, like all over the world, we have trained women's organizations in uh, safe abortion methods with pills. Um, and some of them didn't want to launch an abortion hotline, but they were giving this information to women in their community um, and then spreading it that way so that women around the world started to get to know about uh, the possibility to do an abortion with pills. Now, um, about 15 years ago, after we, so after we did our initial boat campaigns, we started getting a lot of emails from women. When is the ship here? I have an unwanted pregnancy. I need help. Um, and because it's pills, we decided we have to find a way that we can do that legally, which we did. And uh, 15 years ago, uh, Women on Web went online. And this was the first telemedical abortion service ever. So it's a website where women can fill in an online questionnaire. Then there's doctors that are reviewing the questions and making sure that there's no contraindications. And then we work with pharmacies all over the world that can mail uh, and send the medicines by mail to women wherever they are in the world. And we just had our 15 years anniversary um, a month ago. Um, and this um, service, it's based in Canada, because in Canada there is no abortion law. So there's also not a criminal abortion law. And the work has had a huge, tremendous impact uh, on yeah, actually many things. Uh, our help desk is now available in 22 languages, and we oh, answered over a million emails. We helped almost 100,000 women all over the world uh, with access, uh, access to uh, abortion pills. 
Um, but we published a lot of scientific papers uh, in order to, uh, to, to show what happens when women have these abortion pills in their own hands. Is it safe? What are the complications? What is the acceptability? And that influenced the, 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 the publications, the scientific publications influenced actually the launch of other telemedical abortion services in other places like in the United States and in Australia and, uh, and other places around the world. Um, and so one of the things that we found that it's extremely acceptable for women, it's between 98 and 100% of women. And the reason is, for example, where women were writing us that, you know, I could do it in the privacy of my own home. I could, was full control over the surface, the whole procedure. Um, but also, you know, some people, they, these are some of the quotes that we get that were initially anti-abortion and they suddenly realized they were in a situation that they couldn't have a child and how it changed their opinion about how important it is for people to have access to these services. Uh, but also women in Muslim countries, for example, where you could not get pregnant when you're simple, single, you have to be married. Um, and so this was a very private way uh, for women to get access to abortion services. Now, what was very interesting is that because there was a lot of media about what we did, uh, and the first study that we published was in 2008, scientific study, and the Daily Telegraph, which is a huge uh, newspaper in the UK, they wrote, the headlines were, women risk health using abortion website. And seven years later, or eight years later, the same newspaper wrote an article saying, abortion pills, everything you need to know, and saying you have to go to Women on Web, find the website. And so the whole, it, it really totally transformed uh, the research and the service, the public uh, opinion and the public perception about women doing abortions by themselves at home. And it became from a health risk to something that was totally acceptable. And it's really nice to be able to show these data because it's kind of uh, this, to show impacts from an organization this way is, is almost impossible. It's very difficult to do, but we've been able to, to do that. Now, you can find on our website, you can find all the studies that we published. And actually the last study that we published was the 10 years uh, follow-up uh, uh, from, uh, we, because we asked women to fill in a follow-up questionnaire and uh, we analyzed 10 years of the follow-up questionnaires um, then. And also this, for example, uh, the Newsweek, which is a very mainstream scientific uh, um, magazine for lay people, home abortions are safe. We should let women do it themselves. Now, I will talk a little bit about our work in other countries like Ireland. After the abortion vote the campaign that we did in 2001, um, we worked on setting up Women on Web. We started helping a lot of women in Ireland. Um, and we were approached by some new organizations and they wanted to start more act actions again. So we did an abortion train, pill train with them and that where women, they went to Northern Ireland to pick up the pills and then they came home and then in the main railway station in Dublin, they swallowed all the abortion pill. And that action itself is so important. It was a it was a member of parliament that swallowed the abortion pill because one of the rhetorics of the anti-abortion groups was it's dangerous. The abortion pill is dangerous. And when you see a politician swallowing an abortion pill, that does not, that is immediately undermined that statement because nobody would swallow anything if it would be so dangerous. So we, with, these, with these campaigns, we really try to kind of take back um, the messaging and the agenda. Um, and then they did a, an abortion pill bus. And what was interesting is that they, with the bus, they drove around the country and I did the online consultations with people and then they handed out the abortion pills. And they were not prosecuted, uh, even though the police was keeping an eye on them. Uh, so they st started to set up this whole underground network uh, where the activists were delivering abortion pills to women in Ireland. And then the last campaign that we did was the abortion drone. Let me see. Yeah, this is... Um, It's totally hypocritical for the state to deny women the right to choose um, and criminalize them and um, it's totally safe and it's a, as a human right. The 
are not allowed to use abortion pills to end their pregnancy. They have to travel a long way to England to have a safe abortion. So this, uh, this campaign as well was, uh, what we did is the same. We used the, the, the law from one country in order to do something in the other country but was not allowed. Uh, and so what is interesting is abortion was illegal in both countries, both in the, uh, Ireland and in Northern Ireland. But Northern Ireland falls under the English law still, except for the abortion law. And because, so the police came to us before we were doing the drone campaign, are these women pregnant? And we said, yeah, hey, that's the idea, right? You don't know. Um, and so, uh, yeah, but we need to know whether they, whether they are pregnant or not, because to bring in the medicines is not breaking any law. What was illegal is if and swallowing the pills is not illegal either. It's only illegal when you're pregnant and you swallow them. So, um, and we knew that. We had all figured it out. So we were using the Irish and Northern Ireland law in order to, to play this game again. And then the police came and you have to tell us, are they pregnant, are they not pregnant? We said, we're not going to tell you. Yeah, you know, why don't you force a pregnancy test? And we were like challenging them because it's of course totally unacceptable like for any human rights instrument uh, that you force a woman to go undergo a pregnancy test you know as a state you totally lose it when you start doing those things and especially when you think that you're a democratic country with the rule of law and things like that so in the end they didn't do anything they were just standing by just filming the campaign they didn't do anything uh, but this way women got to know more and more and more about the abortion pills and um, what we started doing after that is we started publishing the data of the number of women in Ireland that were using Women on Web. And that was more than 1,000 per year at that moment. And the data was that women were traveling to England. So they were all saying, we don't have to do anything because women just go to England. But what they saw was there was a decline in abortions of women traveling to the UK, and there was an increase in women using Women on Web. And so suddenly the state could not say there are no abortions in Ireland. No, there were. I mean, it was now public. It was on paper. The research was there. It was public. And so it really catalyzed this whole debate about, you know, the legalization of uh, abortion as well. And so this was also recognized, uh, of course, in the press where women buying illegal abortion pills swayed the abortion decision. And all the politicians, even those that were against abortion, uh, in the end voted for changing the law. And now abortion is legal in Poland and that was in Ireland and it, this was in 2018. Um, now this is an email that we received. I tried to bring them a little bit in because it says something really also about how women are experiencing this. This is also a woman that says actually I was pro-life and I voted as such, and I could never understand that the woman would want to have an abortion until I was in that situation myself. And now I understand why it's important that abortion is, has to be legal, that it's really important for women. Um, the Northern Ireland, so after abortion was uh, legalized in Ireland, we did immediately the next campaign in Northern Ireland, because although it's part of the United Kingdom, it was still illegal in Northern Ireland until a year ago. Um, and that had to do with the way that our, the UK is uh, governing uh, the country. And so we did an, uh, another campaign there where we did the same thing, where we used the laws, the different laws of the countries, like big companies do when they want to uh, avoid taxes. They don't want to pay taxes. They have companies all over the world that have to pay different taxes or they don't give up taxes. And so this was the, uh, the abortion robot. And the abortion robot works like this. It's a small, very small robot. We put the pills on the head and then uh, you can connect it with an uh, internet. Uh, you have to need an internet connection and then it can be, uh, it can be monitored, it can be controlled with an iPad from wherever in the world that is also connected uh, with the internet. So um, this is how it looked like. So let me see, this is the robot. It's really, really small, but it was the same thing to show how ridiculous it is that, you know, you have these laws. And, um, and this is a woman also, she took it, she swallowed the pills. The people are dressed up like, um, 
uh, The Handmade Tales, the book of, uh, what's her name? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what was interesting here is that the robots were actually, uh, they were arrested after this campaign. So with this campaign, suddenly we had like four fans full of police, all fully armed, uh, you, you know, because uh, trying to intervene with the campaign, um, trying to, uh, they, they wanted to, uh, 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 to confiscate the robots, but we had, they didn't know, we, we gave them one robot, they thought, okay, now it's over, but we had two, two robots. So when the police went away with one robot, then we did the campaign with the other robot, which was also later confiscated. Uh, and this was my son in Amsterdam, who was driving the robot through the legs of the police uh, into the hands of the women. And he was extremely happy that he could deliver them safely. Now, um, what happened as well is that we started getting, so in the United States, actually abortion is legal, and we started getting more and more help requests from women there. And that's because it's very expensive. And also all the, in the United States, you, it's like Europe, you have a lot of different states and they all implemented their own laws. And so I decided to set up an or, other organization which is called Aid Access. And we help women also getting access to the abortion pills. And I founded it in 2018. And what happened in 2019, I got a letter from the federal drug agencies that I had to stop. And of course that was kind of a bit of a shock um, but then I found a lawyer who was willing to help me and he turned it around. He said, we are going to sue the FDA because it's still a constitutional right. Uh, by the way, the letter from the FDA was signed by 120 members of the Senate in the US, all men, all white, except for one person. And there were these beautiful blue signatures, but it was like, come on, like this is the Senate, you know, the people that are highest in power of the most powerful state <laughs> in the world are, you know, wh wh why do they care about women having access to abortion? You know, and that makes it so visible for me what this really is about. This is not about abortion. This is really fundamentally about controlling women and especially poor women, because the only women that I was helping was the, the poor women that could not afford to go to an abortion clinic because I was helping women for free if they couldn't afford to give anything and otherwise the price was like a, a 90 dollars um, and many women could not pay that so this is about I, I think somehow this is about capitalism more than about uh, women um, and what happened with COVID which is very interesting is that um, so anyway I, I sued the FDA after that and now things are easy but what was interesting is that because these services were in place, we could suddenly really, really uh, prove how COVID was creating more and more obstacles to women. And so, because all these states reacted differently, but um, for example, Texas said, it's not an, an, an urgent medical treatment, so abortions are not going to be provided anymore. In, the, in New York, there was, all the hospitals were totally overwhelmed, abortion clinics closed, and we saw the increase with the increasing of the COVID uh, um, pandemic, we saw the increase in the in number of requests. And this is another paper, again, we always publish about that. Um, I'm going to skip South Korea, we also did work there, and it's all again we worked with local organizations to really visualize this swallowing of the pill in order to make women aware of the fact that pills exist and that they're safe. Um, and so this was another pill swallow campaign, as we call it now. Um, and there, uh, a year later, the court decided that abortion has to be legalized. So abortion was legalized uh, from January this year. Uh, it's now legal in South Korea as well. So it's interesting that in the last five years, so many countries legalized abortion, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Argentina, Thailand, South Korea. Um, yeah. Now, a little bit about the Netherlands, the situation. So we've also looked at the obstacles to abortion care in the Netherlands. And what we've seen is that most of the women uh, are foreigners, women that are studying here or are working here illegally that cannot afford the price of an abortion clinic, which is more than 450 euros. 
Uh, but many women also wanted it just because privacy. They really prefer to have an abortion at home because it's, uh, it's, it's a more convenient way to do it than to have to go to a clinic. Uh, so that's 40% of the people. Um, and then, of course, domestic violence, which was 5% of the women that were, could not get to a clinic because of domestic violence. And this is an example, again, from an email from a girl that was a student, and she said, condom broke, I can't have a child, I can't tell my parents, I'm just an age 19, I cannot afford the 660 euros. And, you know, it's not acceptable just to have a child because you have a broken condom, and that is the reality. So there's still a lot to be improved here as well. Uh, that's what I want to say. An abortion should be available on the prescription of any doctor where you go to a pharmacy, you get the pills, you use them at home, and that's it. It should not be controlled by only a few clinics. In the Netherlands, you have 15 clinics. They're all in city centers. They're in Rotterdam, then Hague, Groningen. There's two um, provinces that have no abortion clinic. Friesland doesn't have one, and Drenthe doesn't have one. And somebody who lives, for example, in one of the Wadden Eilanden, they have to travel for hours to go to an abortion clinic. Even, you know, and, and that is really bad care. That means that we don't give good medical care to the women here in the Netherlands, because it's outrageous that for something that is so safe and that women can do themselves, that they have to travel for hours in order to get access. Now, we have done a lot of court cases against the Dutch government as well, and um, to get this, you know, to become the reality. And there's slowly, there's more and more movement towards uh, at least that the general practitioners can also prescribe the abortion pills. So I think that was my talk. And this is a way that you can, oh yeah. So I, if you don't believe me, fine. Go to the World Health Organization. There's incredible good documents about safety, acceptability, uh, and the support of the World Health Organization, as they call it, self-care for abortion, meaning women can take the pills themselves, and it's safe, and it's acceptable, and uh, it's possible. So this is one of the documents of the World Health Organization. And um, this is where our end. Viagra is so easy to get. And then when you want to have an abortion, you have to jump through all these hoops. Thank you. I will join you. Yes, if you don't fine. mind, I'll put my laptop yeah, on yeah, top yeah, of yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Now we have some time left for questions. So anyone who is watching from home, please upload your questions in the Q&A and then we'll start um, working on them. Um, but first I have another question yeah. because we are standing in a museum yeah. and in front of a stand that houses actually houses uh, your work. Um, can you maybe tell us a bit about your artwork? Because apart from your uh, profession as a doctor, you are also an artist. Um, I, I don't consider myself an artist actually anymore. I did art school. Mm -hmm. I did go to art school and it was very important for me um, because it's for me, it, uh, it gives you the way to. So I think what my, my life is about or my work is about is uh, creating an alternative, better reality. Uh, and I think art can do that as well. It creates yeah. alternative realities that, and in art, it can be, you know, dystopic or uh, mm -hmm. as well. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that is what I try to do. I try to create a better reality for people with my. With and my is it also what is on show here, or is there anything else that we, I mean, we cannot take you there yet. You have to visit the museum yourself on June the 5th and onwards. But for now, is there anything that we can see here that really relates to your story? Did you well, the, what is in the, uh, in the documentary is, sorry, in the, in the uh, exhibition is, for example, you can see the documentary that mm -hmm. was made about our work. It's called Vessel. You can see it on Vimeo as well, but you can also see it here. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see the drone and you can see the robot and some books that we made on the campaigns. The first three campaigns, we made a little book. Uh, so there's just there, there's a display that are the symbolic things mm. of work that we did okay. in the last years. Yeah. So, yeah, please come over and visit. There are actually some questions. Um, thank you very much. If you really like a question, you can also upvote it. Um, but for now, let's start with the first question that was here for quite some time. I 
wonder up until which week of your pregnancy this medication abortion proves to be effective and to be safe. Are there different laws depending on this week of the pregnancy? I think there are two questions. Would yes. you like to answer the no, first? No, yes, I'm sorry, I just <laughs> skipped all that. Uh, uh, what is interesting is even in the countries where it's legal, there's very different laws up till which moment you can do it. For example, in the Netherlands, uh, the abortions are available up to 24 weeks, uh, 22 weeks in practice, actually. Uh, but for example, in Germany and Belgium and France, mm -hmm. it's France is still 15, 14 weeks of pregnancy. In Belgium, it's 12 weeks of pregnancy. In Germany, it's 12 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, in the UK, it's further. In Sweden, it's still 18 weeks. So all these countries have different laws. It's really like it's a mismatch. <laughs> um, and uh, there's now only two countries, I think, three. In, in Europe, where it's still illegal, which is Poland uh, and Malta, mm -hmm. and states like Andorra, it's also still illegal, and some other. Um, but uh, yeah, so the abortion bill actually it works throughout the pregnancy, mm -hmm. but it's safe to use self-use mm -hmm. according to the World Health Organization. It's safe till the yeah. till twelve weeks, okay. so the first trimester. However, research is showing that actually also later in pregnancy, up to about 16 weeks of pregnancy, the complication rate increases, mm -hmm. but it's not that high yet. It's still quite safe and effective. And I think that, um, but I want to say something about reality of abortion. When it's accessible, women already know now, or pregnant people, they know the moment they're pregnant, actually usually even a week before they miss mm -hmm. their menstruation. Like what we see usually is people that, that do the pregnancy test a week before they expect their pregnancy because they know something went wrong. And more than 95% of the people know it before 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. There's only a very small amount of people that need a, an abortion later. And often these are before also, for example, cases for fetal anomalies or a wanted pregnancy that changed into an unwanted pregnancy. And they're usually more complicated cases mm -hmm. um, so uh, and what we all you know later abortions are usually less acceptable to people than early abortions and that is something that you see reflected in the laws around the world but um, if there's good sexual education so that women know their bodies uh, it's very rare that people are finding out that they're pregnant so late in pregnancy and uh, but again, the abortion pills, they work, they work longer, but it's they, they, women, for example, we do sometimes have women that ask for the pills and then they wait, write us and they say, well, actually I'm 14 weeks, can I still use them safely? And what we say is you have to just make an emergency plan. So take the medicines in the mm -hmm. waiting room of a hospital. So in case you have heavy bleeding, that there's a doctor there and you can get treatment and they won't know and they will treat me you like you have a miscarriage. So you just have to plan it better. But in that sense, yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, that's how it works, yeah. Okay, thank you. Next question, how many women have you already helped via the vote clinic and in general through your campaigns? Do you have an estimate? Because I don't think you have an exact number, right? Well, with the vote, actually it's, it's more a symbolic number. I think in Poland we helped about 10 women and the last campaigns in Mexico, we helped three women. In Spain, we helped three women. So the boat is in a country for a few days. And what it does, it's really creating this huge mobilization and this huge public discourse and discussion. And, mm -hmm. and, and what, they, what we've seen after the boat campaigns is that you see a huge shift in public opinion uh, from being you know, more against abortion to being more in favor of abortion because people suddenly, like, if something is illegal, it creates self-censorship, it creates the bull. Um, and so when you suddenly come and you say, and you reframe the issue in a human rights context, mm -hmm. then people feel more, um, they feel more uh, encouraged to talk about what they really believe. And most people are really supportive of abortion rights. Um, but it's in a country where it's illegal, it's very hard to, mm -hmm. to focalize that. Um, so Women on Web has helped more than 100,000 women now uh, over the last year. Huge numbers. Yeah, and I think 8X says, no, it's less. 
I don't know how many at this point actually. <laughs> but it's not only making sure they get access to the pills, but it's also sometimes women don't know that it's legal in their country mm. or they don't know where to go. So we also help them in everywhere. We help them also find access to mm. the local services if they're available or to local options. So it's not that we, you know, we try to always see what is your situation? What can we do for you in that situation? Sometimes it's just, just giving information about, hey, actually you can go there. Mm -hmm go there, get the medicines, we'll tell you what to do and how to do it. Or, for example, we know underground abortion providers in uh, Costa Rica, in all these other mm -hmm. South Latin American countries, and we can help them access um, underground abortions that are safe. But for example, in Brazil, for a long time, if you would just say that you were raped, you could also get in a certain mm -hmm. uh, hospitals, you get, could get abortions, and we knew which hospitals they were. So we're trying to really make sure that women get so access. Apart from the actual activism, it's also a matter of, of, of research yeah. and, and yeah. finding out all and these well, networks that are willing to help women. Yeah, yeah and we are, we, we are very well connected with the whole world <laughs> this, <laughs> this, in this topic and for this you topic. You have already worked yeah. on this for 20 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, that makes you like a dinosaur. <laughs> Next question. What is your opinion on the regulations such as the ones in Germany that require a pregnant person to go to the mandatory counseling sessions before they can go through with it? Well, so actually we just published a paper about uh, the uh, obstacles to access abortion mm -hmm. service in Germany, and it's huge. So actually in Germany, recently there were two or three doctors that have been um, prosecuted and mm -hmm. fined 5,000 euros, I think, because they had written on their website that they're providing abortion services. And this is a law from the time of the Second World War. It's a Hitler. It's a law that was made by Hitler. Um, so there is a movement now also in Germany to try mm -hmm. to change that law. But anything that is mandatory, mandatory counseling, mandatory waiting times that we have here, like mm -hmm. if you find out that you're pregnant here, you have to wait for five days before you can make an appointment with the clinic. It, and it's really cruel because it's, um, it's like you don't, you know, it's like, it's such a mistrust. And I think that is the fundament about it. There's such a mistrust against the capability of women to make decisions about their mm -hmm. own lives and their bodies that speaks from that. When you say, oh, you have, there's no other medical treatment that you have to think about five days. None. So it's- Your uh, only waiting list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's it, yeah. Yeah, so nope. any- because I, I really, before we go through the other questions, I'm really wondering about the Dutch situation, because in, over here, obviously, abortion is legal. But at the same time, there is this big gr growing group, I believe, of people that are uh, protesting against it. Do you see that abortion as a legal act is, is on the threat in the Netherlands? Or? No, I think the problem in the Netherlands is that we are really, really way behind mm -hmm. at this moment what other countries are doing. For example, COVID made that telemedical abortions are now the standard yeah. methods of care in the UK, mm -hmm. in France, in Canada, in uh, the US, yeah. in the US, some states, and we just don't, we don't even go there. So we are way behind all the scientific evidence that is now there. And that is so undutch, mm -hmm. right? Because we tap ourselves on the shoulder that we are so progressive yeah. and advanced, and we're not. Yeah. Uh, we just don't comply. We are, we were way back with where, where the evidence mm -hmm. is. Uh, and what also the recommendations of the World Health Organization are. But that is because we are living in a coalition. There's always the Christian parties that are against abortion or more or less, or they don't want to make it easier or whatever they say uh, with the other parties. And, uh, but now th there's a little bit more movement. There's now a proposal of a law to make it at least possible for general practitioners mm -hmm. also to provide the abortion pill. And there, some of the political parties are now talking about decriminalization mm -hmm. meaning removing it from the criminal yeah. law because a medical treatment does not belong in a criminal code no okay yeah so there so it's not on a treff because i i, I mean yeah. no, i remember I when i was so. growing up in the 90s yeah. um, um it was i mean this was legal but also you uh, Tennessee was legalized etc yeah. etc et yeah. and there was just a really small group of people protesting yeah. against it but nowadays you have these long marches for yeah. life and pro-life yeah. activism 
uh, and I'm just say, don't say pro-life. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. I think it's very important to choose yeah. your sorry, to choose your words because it's not about being pro-life. This is really about no, that's how they anti frame women. Their, 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 <laughs> I, I, I agree. I agree. But it's, <laughs> yeah, it's know, how they know, frame their, their, their I, know that, I know that. I just want to make people aware of the language. <laughs> but uh, no, yeah. I but but a lot of this uh, activism is yeah. sponsored from the United States. Aha. Uh -huh. And the yeah. problem is that it's very hard to trace the um, the, the financial uh, uh, where it comes from because mm. these are foundations that are there they are not public about mm -hmm. where they get the money from. But, but there's uh, a task for follow the money. Yeah, there's a task for, and I think <laughs> that actually the Groene has done yeah. uh, a research in that uh, recently as well. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, of course, there's more more. It's more politicized yeah. than it was. Yeah. Really, let's hope that, yeah. that the tele yeah. the tele help like the, which you can call for yeah. a pill becomes telemedical more more, abortion. Yeah, yeah. thank you. That it yeah. becomes more and more practice yeah. because. So way. I didn't want to attack you. I, no, I, I no. Get very, I'm very no, no, passionate no, no. about this. I, really, <laughs> I understand, <laughs> but I mean, for people at home, maybe it's good to know. Like for me, I grew up with yeah. like I was I was I am now in my mid thirties. I grew up with like these activism acts of women on waves and I was really enthusiastic and I also thought that well this is how now the world will change yeah. because we and us we are that far already but now in the past five years you see all these marches and it yeah. really frightens me yeah it is yeah 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 so but okay <laughs> no and and what yeah. is also frightening what I said is yeah. that the anti-abortion groups they whitewash mm -hmm. themselves so they rename and they do as if yeah. they're giving women friendly services, but actually they're doing the same thing as they did 20 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. And but they get paid by the government to do it, <laughs> which is even worse. They really get so much money. We calculated that they get as much money for a woman that they speak with on the phone as an abortion clinic to give an abortion. Oh, it's crazy. It's horrible. Yeah. Um, let's go back to yeah, the questions sorry. from the audience. Um, do you? Do your organizations do internships or is there any way that we can actively help with one of the campaigns? Good question. Yes, we do have internships and most of the internships are research internships. Mm -hmm. um, things have changed a little bit with COVID. So actually we were drawn into another thing that I think is very important. And we are working on developing a new contraceptive method mm -hmm. that is based on the same active ingredient that is used for the abortion pill, but it's a lower doses. And so we hope that we can start that research. Actually, this week we'll find out whether we can do it in Georgia, but we also want to do it in the Netherlands. And so we hope that we can have women that are in the reproductive age that want to participate in the research to prove that it's safe and effective where can um, we register? Yeah, we don't have that online yet. What okay. I will do is I will, uh, because we're now fundraising for it, because it's really, it's hardcore <laughs> scientific uh, research uh, and uh, medical trials, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that has to comply with everything. And uh, so it's not anymore going a, a, you know, around laws and against law, but it's, we have to comply with the laws, but we hope that it will help you know, it's there's so much space for new contraceptive uh, that doesn't have the side effects of the hormonal contraceptives that doesn't cause depression that women can use flexible as a weekly contraceptive or as a morning and more pre pre after pill uh, pre pre pill or after pill uh, and that you know that 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 we can use in a way that we need to mm -hmm. or, uh, so that is. That's the next frontier for us. But okay. I'll let you know when we have something set up so that you can reach out to your students. Yes, we will. Yeah. So if you have any any questions regarding internships, please send us student general yeah. an email, email and I will yeah. get you in touch with yeah. uh, Rebecca Gompert. Um, what would the effect of taking the abortion pill for a non-pregnant woman, um, those who took that campaign uh, be, for, in, for Nothing. example? Nothing, it has no effect. So what I said is what it, what it so, Actually, that active component is one of the most effective morning after pills, but you need less. So it's 50 milligrams uh, when you use it within five days before or five days after unprotected uh, sex. It helps really, it's a really good morning after. It stops pregnancy, yeah. uh, but it has no other, like you swallow it, it's getting out of your body and that's it. It doesn't it has do anything no... to your menstruation cyclists. Okay. No. no. 
there is another question that relates to what we were talking to earlier. Why would the US fund all these campaigns in the Netherlands against abortion? It's not just the Netherlands. They do it everywhere around the world. And it has to do, that's the Christian mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh, in yeah. the US. And they have an enormous amount of money and they're sponsoring anti anti-gay uh, laws, uh, anti and anything which is not core family, Christian core family, that's what they are against. Yeah. Uh, so, and that is a very, and th these are missionaries. These mm -hmm. are people that, uh, that are believe that they have to convert the whole world to their world vision uh, in order to stop it from the, what's it called? <laughs> the, when the world, <laughs> Uh, stops. <laughs> it's uh, th there's a lot of information about that, and and mm -hmm. I don't really particularly know that much about it because it's too much. If you really need to know, there's but there's a lot of literature and films, and but it's a it's a very powerful movement, and they they uh, yeah, and they're very effective in many countries, also in Latin America and in uh, in Africa, and also anti-gay movement like the laws that are being sponsored, for example, in Uganda, where uh, homosexuality has become a, a crime that can be penalized by death penalty. That is all sponsored by the US. Again, follow the money. <laughs> yeah, follow the money. Yeah. Um, there are so many questions. Let's see the next one. Um, you said that abortions were costly for international students in the Netherlands. Are you referring to the outside EU individuals or also about those from the member countries? Yeah, it doesn't matter. You have to be a Dutch citizen. If you, but it's not quite true because some of the students, if you have a BSN number, mm -hmm. if you get a BSN number and you have a healthcare insurance, you can get a sponsored abortion okay. in the Netherlands. But you have to have both. And many of the international students don't have both. Okay. Yeah. And if you don't have both and uh, you can't afford an abortion, then what? Then you call us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we help. <laughs> okay. Well, please take notes. I think the. Or email us. Yeah. Easier. The final three questions are kind of similar. They are all um, wondering what one could do to participate or to. Uh, to do to help in a day-to-day -day life and maybe that's a that's a great one to finish um, what can we do from our living rooms oh well I think one of the things which is really important is that we are starting to demand mm -hmm. from our doctors that we can get the abortion pills yeah. and so and not being referred to an abortion clinic anymore that it becomes part of the care that doctors so I would say talk with your doctors yeah uh and uh, and ask them will are you willing to do that when i'm pregnant and if they don't that you just tell them that you find mm -hmm. that it's important that it becomes normal health care that's one of the things i think you can do um the other is really if you've had abortion share it mm -hmm. talk about it break the taboo break the shame mm -hmm. um have a conversation about it but also learn to talk about it because the, um, so, uh, and, 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 and also, like, I, for example, a really good book to read is Peter Singer's pra mm -hmm. Practical Ethics, uh, in order to also learn the argumentation, because it's sometimes hard when you're standing against somebody who's really against abortion. But when does life start? Until when do you believe? And what is it? And, and learn to have that conversation uh, that you're not intimidated and that you know what is your uh um and explore your um values in this what is the limit why question yourself because um uh and yeah and the other thing what you can do is um whenever you go to a country on holiday when you can go on holiday again um uh take information with you about abortion pills talk with women that you meet there and tell them hey do you know there are abortion pills that you can use if you would get pregnant mm -hmm. so spread the knowledge that women everywhere know it that's an easy one what we always have is also we made stickers that you can sticker them everywhere in public bathrooms uh you know abortion pills and but also if they're for foreign students or that you work with ask them what is the situation in your country learn try to learn try to discuss and talk about it and what else can you do um 
Maybe we can go to your website. <laughs> yeah, go to the website always. Yeah. And and see what information we can find and also yeah. see if if one would like to fund one of your campaigns. Yeah, and also, can... yeah. 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 Always the possible funding is always <laughs> welcome, of course. I always hesitate to ask for it, but uh, because it's such a stupid thing, I give money and then we'll do uh, something with it. But uh, but of course it's true. But if you would give money now, we would use it for the development of the new contraceptive. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that would be nice that we stay in touch. And then when we can start to study that we let you know, and then we hope that some of the people here want to participate. Thank you yeah. very much, Rebecca Gompers. Um, I'm really honored to have you as our guest, and I'm really honored that you um, took us into this world of activism uh, on uh, yeah, human rights, women rights, human rights. Yeah. Um, also, thank you very much to Floor van Spaandonk uh, yeah. and the team of Bureau Europa for uh, joining us with this program uh, and yeah, hosting us in this beautiful venue. And from everyone who is watching from home, thank you very much for attending. Uh, I really do hope that you learned a lot and also I really do hope that we can welcome you in our lecture hall after summer because now this is the final lecture of this season um, and after summer maybe we can be there in person, who knows, I would love to. But for now, have a great evening and see you next time. Thank you so much. <laughs>